Uh, my name is Paul Vangiola, uh, who's a captain, U.S. Air Force. I enlisted when I was 19 years old, on uh, June 30th, 1942. I was fascinated by flying. Since I can remember being five years old, uh, uh, Wiley Post and Lindbergh and all those people, we went overseas and we joined the 57th Fighter Group in Naples. And I was amazed to find the 57th Fighter Group uh, was not doing aerial escort work. They were doing dive bombing and strafing with the same airplane. And uh, that was a new experience for me, and I inquired about that of the commanding officer, and he says, well, he says, you get on-the-job training here. <laughs> so I learned how to dive bomb with that fighter and, uh, and do strafing of the trucks that were on the road there to transports from the Nazis. It was May 27, 1944. I'd flown an early morning mission, uh, which I remember as uh, very successful because as I, I pulled out from my dive, I looked back and I saw my bombs explode and the end of the bridge fell into the river. So it was, it was a good, good trip. And then, then uh, I went back, we flew back, then I was on a second mission when I showed on around noon. But as I came around, I went down the other side of the railroad track, and there was a guy with a 20 millimeter cannon shell shooting at my buddies as they were coming in. And so uh, I opted the next time, and I went around and came down with my wingman, uh, and we, we attempted, we couldn't find him, then. We, but we went one more time. The second time, we did find him. And as I was firing at him from a very close range, like as high as the telephone wires I, on, the, on the railroad track, uh, I got hit. Uh, I had an explosion in the cockpit, and you know, it was really a, a very traumatic experience. I, uh, being a smart uh, kid with even a, a, a cocky fighter pilot, I, I said, oh well, my hand, my hand was really blown apart. It was unbelievable, it was destroyed almost. I saw fly with my left hand, and then the stick had been shot off, so it was a stump down below, and I had to reach down, but the left hand wouldn't work. I didn't realize at the time that I had that part of that missile or another shell came through the cockpit, knocked off my control stick and shattered my hand and went continued through my parachute harness and my parachute ripcord and uh, tore up my inside of my left arm. And I knew I, was, I, was, I had to get this plane on the ground as fast as I could. And I chose not to become a prisoner and I didn't go down in Italy. I could have gone down right there. So I flew back over the water. <laughs> I was running on the auxiliary tank, the inside tank, and as I checked my fuel, I found that I had the gauges indicating I had about 10 gallons left in that tank, and I had a full tank of 210, mm -hmm. and my 10 gallons were never going to get me home, so I had to switch the tanks. But of course, my left arm was paralyzed. I, 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 I couldn't do a thing. And then I, I had to evaluate, do I take off my harness and reach over? Well, if I did that, I'd never get it back on. And I anticipated I'm probably not going to have a very pleasant landing, so I better keep the belt on. And I took my foot, my left foot, and I reached over there and turned that selector valve. And it used to, with your hands, you could feel the click when it went into place, but I assume it went into place because I'm here. Now I was over the water, and I was getting a little foggy. And so anyhow, as, as fate would have it, at that moment, I looked to my left, and there was the island of Corsica, the lighthouse at the upper point. I turned, and now with my other decision had to be made. I had that belly tank underneath, and I, uh, I, I just didn't, the judgment, didn't have the judgment to land that airplane properly. So I left the landing gear up. I cut the, uh, cut the fuel off, cut the engines off, put down full flaps, and, and went screaming. And, I, and the reason I did that is I picked out a, f a field just south of the city of Bastia. It was a, a strip. But I didn't have to go another 30 or 40 miles to get to a friendly base. That was, that was the place I go. So I went in there, and it was a very fast. The high came in very fast, uh, faster than I should have been. But the plane wouldn't, wouldn't land because it was still flying when I eased back on a stick. Uh, so I finally just pushed it in very slowly, and uh, that's what saved my life, they tell me. Otto was in the U.S. Navy during World War II, started out as a seaman, first class, and when he left the service, after the war, he was chief petty officer. The Houston was one of the few ships out in the Pacific at the early part of the war. Mm -hmm. And it was sent out to uh, hold time. They were, um, it was a heavy cruiser, mm -hmm. and they were making their way through the Sunda Straits between Sumatra and Java, 
when they ran into an overwhelming Japanese fleet. And the Houston CA-30 and the HMAS Perth, an Australian cruiser, were the only two ships to take on the battle that ensued. And of course, with the overwhelming odds and no equipment and no support from overhead or otherwise, as both ships went down, and the men were torn loose in the Java Sea, in Sunda Strait, and then they were picked up eventually. Uh, many Japanese ships were floating about, boats they would be then, and they would be shooting some of the men in the water. But he at one point said that it was dark. Of course, the ship went down after midnight and it was dark, and he was floating in the water. He could hear the Japanese coming and speaking Japanese as they floated about, and he hid his head in an air pocket underneath his arm at one point, and somebody poked him with a boat hook, and he thought, sure, they would fire if they knew he was alive, and so he just played dead and rolled in the water, and that passed. But eventually, another boat came by, and he was taken aboard and taken into the shore. And so uh, he said his first introduction was he sat down from exhaustion, having been in the water for hours, and he got told to get off whatever it was he was sitting on by being hit on the side of the head. And he said that was his introduction to what was about to happen for the next few years. When Otto uh, left home at an early age, he uh, really left his family. And so those periods out in the prison camps really became a family. The men depended upon each other, and consequently they had a bond that goes beyond the bond of brothers, and still does. And so when he came home, they were just brought home without any rehab whatsoever in those days, being so early in the war. They really didn't know how to rehabilitate, I guess, that early stage of men that went through what they did. And so they were torn from a jungle, thrown into a uniform at home, and sent home. In fact, I remember him saying when he arrived here in Newark, which was his home, in the middle of the night, got off the train at Penn Station. He said he never felt so alone. He didn't really know what to do. He hesitated wanting to go home as much as he wanted to see his mother and sisters. And so he just sat there, and he came upon a soldier who was on his way home to Nutley, a place not far from where Otto was heading in North Newark. And the soldier said he didn't have much fare to get home. And Otto said, well, good, I have plenty. I'll, you come with me. And he said it was wonderful just to have somebody's company. The men of the Houston should be remembered as true believers in all that the United States always stood for, which was the freedom and the blessings that we have. And they were willing and, and willingly gave their lives for that very purpose. And the country and the world should never forget that. My uh, first job out of NJC, September of 1941, was with Pathé News. It was a newsreel. It came out weekly. And they were looking for a, a librarian to be trained in film library work. And I was hired. And uh, what we were taught to do was we would view the weekly newsreel in a projection room and very rapidly transcribe what we saw on the screen. After the war broke out, there was a big demand for people trained in that kind of work. And uh, I was offered jobs by several departments, but I chose the one with the Office of War Information because it was in Manhattan. The other jobs would have been in Washington, D.C. And when I was hired to work at the Office of War Information, they already had a lot of film in their vaults. We received a lot of combat footage. Um, general news from overseas. And by cataloging that, we were able to make that available to other newsreel companies, to magazines, to 
producers of documentaries and producers of Hollywood movies, they would come in requesting certain stock shots. And if we were up to date in our cataloging, we were able to pinpoint and produce or provide them with the footage that they needed. It not only helped me understand, it made me that much more fearful because I had a husband there in the midst of it. And uh, if, if mail was late in coming to me, I started to worry that much more because I'd seen footage maybe the day before of scenes that were not too easy to, to catalog and to, not easy to forget about. Uh, in Europe, I was assigned to the 28th Infantry Division at first. The 28th Infantry Division came into uh, Normandy after the invasion. I was with them until I was hospitalized uh, in uh, Luxembourg. Uh, and uh, after hospitalization, uh, I was assigned to the 100th Infantry Division. And I functioned with the 100th Infantry Division until the end of the war. And at the end of the war, the 100th Infantry Division was assigned to go to Japan. And uh, uh, that, of course, ended as soon as the atom bomb was thrown into Japan and the war was over. And uh, I immediately was transferred to a military intelligence uh, center for repatriation, and then came home. It was uh, almost indescribable. He was very thin. He must have lost about 50 pounds, <laughs> but good looking. And, uh, and so was she. <laughs> <laughs> it was just probably the happiest day of my life, probably. I was, felt very fortunate. Some other women I knew weren't as fortunate as I was. And it was uh, just the reunion we had both been waiting for for two years, I guess. These are, these are very difficult things to, to describe. Uh, it was like coming back to a new world because your attitude in the in the milieu that you were in was that it was going to last forever. I had no concept of coming, of wanting to, I, I knew I wanted to come home, but ever coming home. And I think if I had any other attitude, um, <laughs> it wouldn't have been good. It, I was totally involved and committed. Uh, and it was like coming home was like uh, coming to a new planet almost again and a new life because we had we had been married just before I went overseas we were so engrossed in what we were doing and then all of a sudden out of the clear blue sky some guy hollered, say, look, look up the mountain. And you know, so just, we stopped, we, and it looks like everybody stopped at the same time. And it, it's hard to describe the situation, but you, you, you would have had to been there to see Excuse me. To see these five or six guys struggling to put that flag up. But anyway, they they get the flag up and the whole island is just quiet. You 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 would have to you couldn't believe it. All the firing and everything that was going on, all of a sudden everything stopped. Then the the ships out in the harbor um, 
course, American ships. They started sounding their horns, and it was like a big party. And uh, we just, we figured now here the island's secure, and, you know, we're going to get the hell out of here, you know. And lo and behold, I guess 10 minutes later, all hell broke loose. And till this day, and uh, they pick it up in that magazine. Uh, I remember my lieutenant, uh, he got hit first. And when I saw him, I didn't know exactly what had happened, you know? And then all of a sudden, the shrapnel, and then I got hit. And the guys, the tankers, They came and pulled us out and, and pulled us into the tank. But um, the um, Japanese, they, they were in that mountain uh, just waiting for us. And they, they really poured it on. They, the whole, the whole, whole war broke out again, really. And we're saying, you know, we're really confused. <laughs> we're saying, what happened there, you know? And next thing you know, so we trying to get our defense together, and by then, I'm laying under this tank, and uh, the lieutenant's over there. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been under a tank. It's just like being under that table there, you know? So uh, when things quieted down, they put us on a stretcher and got us down to the well, we were fortunate because the aid station was right there at the beach, you know, where the ships had come in. So we didn't have far to go. And by the time I ended up there, um, we were on the, the one of the few hospital ships, you know. And um, when I woke up, I had these white sheets. You know, <laughs> I thought I was in heaven or something, you know. <laughs> I hadn't seen white sheets in so long, you know. And uh, then I realized, hey, you know, I'm still alive, you know. And, uh, uh, well, I guess the next thing I know, you know, we were off. <laughs> the war was over for me, you know. and. Uh, I still give the military credit for what I am today, you know, be whatever it is. Uh, and I think most of the guys I know, there's just something, a bond there that you pick up with other people that you don't normally get. Basic training was geared to um, uh, learning differences uh, from civilians' life to military. We had uh, exercises of marching and uh, formations and uh, uh, that type of thing, but it, it was all uh, necessary to get the change from uh, um, civilian to military, and then we got our clothing, and uh, our quarters were uh, comfortable. They were uh, barracks type, and uh, but they were sectioned in rooms. We weren't in an open barracks like the men there seem to be. I'm a um, graduate of the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, was at King's Point and was assigned uh, to several ships, but the most important ship was the troop transport, which was the old, it was an old cruise ship, uh, the Mariposa, which was a cruise line off of all the Pacific Hawaiian Isles and so forth. Well, anyway, that was converted into a troop transport and it was able to ferry something like 8,000 troops from one spot to another. But this particular time, we participated in, in a 
thing called Operation Torch. Mm -hmm. That was a time when the French, the Vichy French, decided they did not want to be on the part of the United States but wanted to be affiliated uh, with the Germans. And subsequently, they had a several armies, several large armies in French Iran in French. And so they got together this Operation Torch where they had all these troop transports and so forth and went into several spots. I, my ship was into uh, Oran and we deposited uh, about 8,000 8, 8, soldiers to fight the battle. It, going through the Straits of Gibraltar, we were informed that the submarines were waiting for us. They had masses of submarines, and they had uh, airplanes that were flying to try to stop us. And several of our troops, uh, ships, got sunk. We had uh, gun crews that were on board this uh, transport uh, that fired and fired, were firing up against the air, air, airplanes that were coming over. The German Luftwaffe was coming down. And luckily we got by without getting torpedoed. And so we were able to get our troops onto Iran and then we got ourselves back out again. My name is Edgar Wolf Jr. Uh, at, uh, I reached the rank of captain eventually, but during World War II, the highest I reached was uh, first lieutenant. Chabwa in Assam, Province of India was the headquarters for the China Burma. The, I think it was the China Burma India wing, but anyway, there the crews that arrived were assigned to the other bases that were associated with uh, Air Transport Command. Uh, I was one of the early rides there. We were over, sent over on Project Seven, which was some sort of priority project, and uh, I stayed right there at Chabwa. Each each base had an officer on duty called the officer of the day. And regardless of whether the commanding officer of the base was there to fill in the, the uh, intricacies of when he was not, let's say he was off duty, the, the commander of the base, you had full responsibility of the base. Uh, so I went on duty at 6 a.m. this particular day. Uh, it just so happened that it was the day that the Japanese capitulated and surrendered. And of course, everybody went wild. Uh, they they foresaw, foresaw the fact uh, that uh, they would be going home soon. Uh, so uh, to celebrate, uh, they, would, they went into the aircraft and they took out the very pistols and the flares. Very pistols fired the flares, which were there for emergency purposes only but it was like fireworks. Uh, and they were going off all over the base. Of course, whatever liquor, beer was around was flowing freely and uh, they were enjoying every moment of it. I think we got about 60% of the flights off the next morning. Uh, meantime, you're, we're at past six o'clock in the morning when I was to be relieved and no relief showed up. Uh, and I kept on going until about noon he showed up and in good enough condition to take over as officer of the day. And the chief clerk of the base commander came over and awakened me and he said, uh, the commander wants to see you. So the first thing I think of, my God, what did I do wrong? And he said, Lieutenant Wolf, sit down, relax. Nothing serious. At my staff meeting this morning, told me what went on and what you did. And he said, I have a reward for you. He said, I'm issuing orders for you to immediately fly back to the United States. And this, of course, again, was an uh, unofficial VJ day. There was a tremendous explosion that bodily picked me up from where I was sleeping, threw me up against a steel bulkhead, opened my scalp. I was bleeding and my scalp was open. And I knew I had to get the hell out of there. And so I came out through the passageway and of course there were no lights, it was dark. Steam pipes were bursting all over. I realized that 
my only solution is to survive, was to get off that ship as quickly as possible. And the only obstacle at that point was this food locker that was there. So I knew I had no other choice but to try to scam, scramble up and get out through the hole. And there was an opening, probably around 12 inches. And I scrambled out and hit the top deck. And, and, my, and it was up to my knees. The water had gotten so fast. And so I swam away. So here I was swimming around. And I'll tell you, it was, it was really bad. I saw all these heads swimming around. And then, one by one, their heads dropped. And they went down. And I couldn't do anything to help. But I prayed to God. And I said, God, spare me. I said, if you do, I will, I will make my life meaningful and do good. And down about, I don't know, a mile or so, happened to look and saw this destroyer coming along. And I said, my prayers have been answered. We were close to the enemy territory, and a lot of snipers, you know, would be out, out behind the line, all that sort of thing. And I can remember this one night, I went to the OP, and this guy, I'm going this way, and he's going that way. And I gave him the password, and he didn't, he didn't respond. So then I, I caught my 45, you know, and I gave the password the second time. I kept walking. He kept walking. He never said nothing, so I kept right on going. The Manhattan Project sent recruiters to the senior classes. They were looking for clerical help. We knew it was a war project, that it was uh, sensitive and secret. The fact that it was an atom bomb project was not, of course, known at all. The day that we learned that uh, the bomb had been dropped, um, when the war was, when the armistice was declared, and there was a big, uh, you know, all the fuss on Times Square, I didn't get there for some reason. I guess my mother didn't allow me to go down there.